I'm Marvin Mills. I am going to lecture today on the Taj Mahal, the most beautiful building in the world. <clears throat> and what I will attempt to show is that the Taj has been misinterpreted through the centuries up to today. And I will try to show evidence and convince you that the Taj was really not made by the Mughal dynasty, by Shah Jahan, but was uh, built centuries earlier. I am a, an architect and an architectural historian, and this is, has been an interest of mine for many years. This is a portrait, a miniature portrait of Shah Jahan, the Mughal emperor of the 17th century, who is alleged to have built the Taj Mahal for his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal. This uh, fiction has been circulated for a very long time, and it is very appealing, and it is very romantic, but it is important to get the record straight so that history is telling the truth. The man who first revealed that the Taj was not built by the Mughals, but was built centuries earlier by the Hindus in India, is a man named Pian Oak, whose book on the uh, Taj Mahal, a Hindu palace, came out in 1968. And, and I consider it one of the most important books in the last 50 years on the question of the history of architecture. What he has to say in his book about the Shah Jahan is that he was far from being a builder of anything. Shah Jahan was a destroyer. And the words of Shah Jahan's court chronicler, Mullah Abdul Hamid Lahori, it had been brought to the notice of his majesty that during the late reign, many idol temples had been begun but remained unfinished at Benares, the great stronghold of infidelity. The infidels were now desirous of completing them. His majesty, the defender of the faith, gave orders to him that all the temples that had begun should be cast down. It was now reported that 76 temples had been destroyed in Benares. So that this man who is record of building in India depends on his having an ecumenical attitude, a fair attitude, a reasonable attitude towards his Hindu subjects is really quite the opposite. He was dedicated a man opposed to the Hindu religion and all its symbols that were incorporated in its architecture. And here's the Taj Mahal, as everyone thinks of it. It is an absolutely a stunning building, but the odd part is that it is really a more beautiful building than it has been given credit for. Why? Because it has been assumed that this is a tomb for the wife of Taj Mahal. But actually, it was a palace for an earlier Hindu ruler. Since its real function is to have been a palace rather than a tomb, then its beauty is enhanced because its, its form is more fitting to its function as a palace than as a tomb, as I shall try to demonstrate. The symbols in the Taj are overwhelmingly Hindu. And while it may appear to be Muslim to most of us, it is only because we're reading back into history from the Taj saying, if this is the Taj, then these must be a Muslim uh, symbols and forms. But notice in the, in the, uh, the lotus leaf here that the, this form, this semicircular horseshoe form is based on the lotus leaf. And the lotus leaf is the most important symbol in all of Hindu, Hindu religion, perhaps. This form is repeated in the bulbous stone of the Taj Mahal. We also have to consider that if this is a building that was around in the 17th century, then it must have been, somebody must have noticed it. Somebody must have lived there. Uh, 
much to bring it of it having been there up to the 17th century. And in this case, we have the chronicles of Babur, the first of the Mughal emperor. This incursion, which when translated by P. N. Oak, reveals that, that in these words, in that chronicle, that it was indeed an extremely lofty, full of verdure to the south of the great city, Agra. Uh, prior to this was the palace of Raja Man Singh. <clears throat> In exchange uh, of that, the great, the great palace was granted government land so lofty that in its stature it is a memorial to the courage of sky dimensions. In other words, I interpret this, as does P. N. Oak, as a description in the earlier Babur Chronicles of the Taj Mahal, where Babur stayed for a while. <clears throat> there was a meeting there that was recorded in the Babur Chronicles that a large party was held in the pillared porch of a dome building standing in the middle of Sultan Ibrahim's private apartments. This too is a description in my view of the Taj Mahal. And here's the Taj. As one approaches it from the entry, uh, it is beautifully outlined against the sky. It is a sculptural uh, piece. It is beautifully designed. And <clears throat> Here I'm showing you a picture of a, uh, this is Vishnu. This is the most important of the Hindu gods. And he is lying on the great serpent, asleep, waiting for the world to begin anew. The world begins with a lotus growing from the stomach of Vishnu. Uh, Brahma is seated there, and Brahma calls for, <clears throat> begins to call for the world to be brought into existence. These symbols of, are extremely important and are illustrated in the Taj themselves. It is Shiva who dances the world into existence and dances it out of existence. And there are symbols of Shiva in the Taj. Mind you, no symbol, no Hindu symbols would have been allowed had this been built by the Mughals. Because of all the religions that the Mughals opposed, it was Hinduism that was perhaps their most, uh, that they're most antagonistic to. This is a, a picture, this is a painting in the Ajanta Caves, uh, second century BC to sixth century AD, of the Bodhisattva Padmapani. This Bodhisattva of compassion and grace is here holding the lotus, this great symbol of, of, uh, of Hinduism. This picture showing grace and charm and subtlety and beauty Note the feeling for this painting, and remember that we are, that we, I am saying, and I hope to convince you, that this type of beauty is incorporated in the Taj Mahal, this type of effortless grace. And here is the lotus itself. All parts of it are of interest to the architectural symbolism. Here is the lotus bud. And it's the lotus bud that is incorporated in the dome of the Taj. Here's the lotus leaf. Here's the lotus fruit. And here is the lotus itself. And here are the lotus petals. Here's a site plan of the Taj. <clears throat> Notice it's a very complex thing. This is the Taj building itself that we're familiar with. But it's a complex involving gardens, uh, residences, mosque, entryway, courtyard, 
and a, and a wall that surrounds. It is oriented north, south, east, west, so that you come in on the south, and this is the north, and the Jumna River is here along its northern edge. This is the orientation that is generally used by Hindu temples, but not generally used by a Muslim mosque, which would necessarily be oriented to Mecca. In this case, the mosque that you see here is oriented due west, and Mecca is not due west, it's some 12 degrees off, so that it uh, leads one to believe that perhaps this was not indeed a mosque when it was begun. Here's the forecourt uh, with the stables and with uh, places for sale, a bazaar and so forth. And here is the entry looking back with the, uh, these are the characteristic kiosk and bells that are characteristic of Hindu architecture. And here's the site plan simplified showing these various elements. The plan of the Taj Mahal is by actually symmetrical, as you can see. Here are entrances on four sides. Here is the central atrium. Uh, here is the screen that surrounds the cenotaph. And here is the tomb of Taj Mahal of here. And here is here, and here is uh, Mumtaz. But note, too, that this plan is not really a plan, in my view. That tantric art, a, a form of Buddhist and Hindu religion, uh, art devoted to the tantrism, is a, is a magical symbol, very similar in, in general to the design of the Taj, with its four entrances, as you can see here. So that the, the plan of the Taj is, in my view, actually a uh, tantric art symbol, a mandala, to be read from the sky. Now here is the entrance to the, this is the main building, and what you see when you look up is one of those four entries. Uh, here is the Koran, which has been inscribed at a later date than my belief, where Hindu symbolism has been removed. Here is a trident that is at the very peak of this arch. And here is a symbol of, out of this pinnacle of the lotus fruit. The main pinnacle here is 32 feet high and rests on top of the central dome. The Taj is beautiful at all times of day, so that it sometimes it looks, it's marble, it has a gray tone, sometimes a honey color tone, but it's eight-sided, and <clears throat> it uh, takes advantage of these deep-set niches and entryways to soften the glare of the sun. This is a picture of myself and my daughter visiting in the 70s at the Taj. There is a dado at the entrance, a, a wainscot, where there are symbols that are incorporated in the relief sculpture. Uh, P. N. Oak interprets these flower symbols as the own symbol the sacred sound that begins the world. And he claims that in here, you can read the Om symbol itself in these flower symbols. In any case, the Taj is a, is a model of engineering, mechanical and structural, and it's cool. In spite of the extreme heat, the screens, the air, circulation, uh, all help in 
keeping it comfortable. And the views are very interesting too because one can look through and see the opposite buildings right through these solid screens that are carved out of marble. Here is the residence beyond that one can see through the screen. And it's interesting too that the Taj, though 90% or more brick, appears to be made of marble, but that's only the veneer, the white marble. Uh, other parts uh, of the complex are made of red sandstone with some white marble, so that you have this interesting surround of the red sandstone around the, the white marble central building, which I believe was dedicated um, mainly to Shiva. Now here's the well over here and the mosque next to it. Interesting, the mosque itself uh, has three domes, the central dome and one on either side of it, which is uh, to me rather strange in that Ordinarily, if one were designing a mosque, one would be sure that the, there would be a sense of unity of single, of God being one, and of none of three, which is an anathema, and is an anathema to the uh, Muslim religion. So the three domes uh, concept is not something that I believe they would have ordinarily done. Here is the well that is adjacent to it, a rather elaborate well, which I took a photo of, and this light here is the flash of the camera in the water below. And there are several stories where people could live in comfort from the air conditioning from the water. This type of well is typical of the Hindu uh, architecture. The wall that surrounds the uh, complex is very formidable. And one has to understand that if it were simply a question of uh, defending uh, a tomb, one would not have gone to such elaborate measures, perhaps, to have defended it. But a palace needs a defending, and this wall is its main defense. Now, in the 17th century, when fortified walls were built, they were often built in this zigzag manner because artillery was already being used in warfare. And by creating a zigzag, one was able to put gun emplacements here and fire down on the enemy or across at the enemy. So that the straight wall with its crenellations on top, which are part of the Taj, would not have been built that way in the 17th century if it was defense that they were interested in. Surrounding the Taj are these four minarets, alleged minarets. But it's odd that you have in the first place four minarets, you only really need one, although in the history of Muslim architecture there are four or two. But it's also stranger yet that there are uh, abundance of minarets around the main building, but the mosque itself has none. So there are no minarets around the mosque and four around the main building. The, what you have here is a residence, which is a mirror image of the mosque on the opposite side of the main building. But now this is a strange anomaly in that these two buildings are built exactly alike and yet for different purposes. One is said to be a mosque and one is said to be a residence. Now I put it to you and to many of the architects who are listening to this lecture that for two buildings to have the same design for different purposes doesn't make much sense. It would make more sense if they had different design. So one of them is not what it's supposed to be, or both. 
But there are some magnificent views of the towers and buildings silhouetted against the sky. There's a second floor inside, which visitors rarely get to see because it's locked. And it's really been stripped of its ornament. There used to be a, a marble uh, wainscot, which was probably used by Shah Jahan in his rework of the building. And here is the central atrium with a screen around the two cenotaphs. And here's a screen with embedded ceramic tiles and precious stones, semi-precious stones. But note here that on the top of the screen, you have this type of ceramic. You have the uh, a bowl and a uh, stream, and it's a washing, a what I consider, and I learned this from up, to be the lingam of the Shiva. So what you have here, here is the bowl, here is the milk pouring down, and here is the lingam on the screen. There are a total of 108 of these symbols all along the screen. 108 is a very important figure because it has to do with the precession of the equinoxes, which is another subject which is highly complex, but it has to do with the fact that the Earth wobbles on its axis, that the sun uh, rises amongst the constellations at a different point during the year. After 26,000 years, it wanders and comes back to its beginning. So that after a, a 108, <coughs> there, there are after 72, rather, and 72 plus 36 gives you the 108. Uh, this figure has been believed to be an important figure for the ancients in determining astronomy and predicting eclipses and in determining their future. So 108 is not a, a, a fortuitous number, it's important. And here is the journal on the north side of the Taj. And part of the uh, fantasy concerning the Taj is that, yes, there's, here is the, the model white Taj, but that was intended to be another built across the way, so there would be one for Mumtaj and one for Shah Jahan. There's no evidence that this is the case. It's just delightful to believe. These entryways, in my view, are symbols of the lotus petal. That's where this form comes from. These are the Mukarnas, or the uh, the multiple type of incised uh, sculpted insects, which I believe derived from a, a Buddhist architecture. And sometimes in the corner <coughs> of the archway, in the shoulder, we have this type of symbol, which I believe is a symbol of the trident of Shiva. And here it is again at a smaller scale. Here is the trident and set into a flower. And here is a 18th century Rajput painting showing Shiva with his consort, Parvati. And no, but notice the symbolism here. Here is his trident. Notice on Shiva's head is this crescent. And notice too that here are the snakes or cobras that adorns his body. These are all symbols that are used in the Taj. A cross section of the Taj shows a very complex building and was very difficult to build and time consuming. 
Here is the dome, a bulbous dome, which, mind you, is a very difficult thing to build out of masonry. And here is some 75 feet of space between the interior dome and the exterior. And here is the river down below. And here are these huge foundations going down to bedrock to give the whole thing stability. So altogether, there are about seven levels. The idea that Shah Jahan coming back from Burhanpur, where his wife died after her 14th delivery, uh, <clears throat> that, that whole, whole and that after a year, a year and a half, he was already able to bury her on the site. It doesn't make any sense from an architectural point of view. It would have taken too long to have built all of this, to design it, to excavate it, to, uh, and to eventually build it. And here's the pinnacle over here. The, the pinnacle is laid out flat in the terrace by the Taj. And it's 32 feet long, an exact duplicate of the actual pinnacle. It's made up of these uh, watering water pots, a crescent, sheetless crescent, a uh, <clears throat> mango leaves, and a coconut. Go back. So that what has been alleged that this is a symbol of the Islamic crescent is probably not true. That the Islamic crescent is uh, not shown uh, this way. It's often uh, on a diagonal like this. And these are the mango leaves and the coconut, uh, the watering pots, are all symbols of the Taj. Here's a terrace that faces out to the Jumla, with the stairways going down to rooms below. Some 21 rooms below. Here's a terrace, an interesting design. And here, looking out from the beach, you see here the, the side of the uh, terrace. And these are what used to be windows of the 21 rooms, which have been bricked up. And here's a doorway leading from the beach that go up to these rooms. Here's a plan showing the rooms, the river, the corridor, and the space here on this side of the corridor, which is under the Taj. This room may have idols or remnants of the original building that were, born, that were bricked up and placed here. One has to open up this wall to find out. And here is the doorway that was bricked up. Uh, and my guide at that time, and what I was able to obtain from the guide was a piece of wood from the old door of this bricked up doorway. That piece of wood, when carbon dated, turned out to be 250 years younger than the Taj date of 1628. No one has ever tried to date the Taj by carbon 14 before, except myself that I'm aware of, and nobody has tried to verify it by doing it again or taking samples of wood or brick from some other part of the building. Brick would give us an opportunity to date it by thermal luminescence. And here is the carbon 14 test that was done in New York by a, a Dr. Williams, giving a, an entirely different date of Taj that has been assumed. But one must be aware that one carbon date is not enough to for certitude, but it is enough to question. And the scholarly world should have picked up on it long before this to have duplicated the experiment. And here's the stairs behind that door that's going up to the rooms. In these rooms, here is P.N. Oak himself and his colleagues, my daughter 
and here are the bricked up windows. These rooms must have been used for <coughs> a, a residential purpose. Uh, people arriving by boat on the Juma uh, could have stayed here and had the fresh breezes coming out from the river and lived in, in these 20 or so rooms. They're beautiful ceiling, vaulted, net vaulted ceiling, which were painted and decorated, some of it which still remains. Here's the type of decoration that you can still see in that ceiling. And here's the corridor alongside the rooms. And here's a, a bricked up entry to the main room on the side of the corridor facing away from the 20 rooms. One has to enter this, knock this out, and see what's there. So far, the Archaeological Survey of India refuses to do that. And here's the shoulder of the arch, beautiful design, with the uh, inset uh, uh, stonework. And on the corner of the surround, in the northwest corner, you see the, some typical Hindu type of construction. These brackets, which are used by the Hindus. Here are lotuses in the uh, corners and the grill to provide ventilation. And here is the lotus flower itself. And here's a beautiful corner detail. Up on the roof, there are five domes, the main dome and four smaller ones. And these domes have the, are kept by the lotus upside down. Over here on the side, you notice these are the cobras of Shiva. And here are the petals around the base of the drum of the main door. And looking up past the cobras, there is the pinnacle. We also have in the area of the garden, we have what they call a drum house, a drum house to make music. But there are two of them, one on each east and west. Now the odd part about a drum house is that in a uh, Muslim tomb or cemetery, there is no music allowed. You would not have a drum house. But drum houses and music are uh, very much in order in a Hindu palace. Notice here in these arches, you have the scalloped arch. The scalloped arch, I believe, derives from the symbolism of the hood of the cobra. Here's a view of the mosque again, with, as I said before, with the three domes. The, uh, <clears throat> this type of construction with the knife-like edge, the cha-cha type of construction, is typical also of uh, the Hindus. Here's the interior of the atrium and the ceiling above. In the ceiling above, you have this very center, a chain, which seems to go nowhere. According to Oak, which makes some sense, it held a watering can, which was used to anoint the statue of Shiva, the, not the statue, but the lingam of Shiva down below. Around it are the serpents, around here, and then beyond that, there are symbols of the lotus.
Back in 1991, I wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times where I tried to separate the Taj Mahal from legend, and I give credit to Piano, a man who has never cited, never mentioned his books are not on the shelves of the library. He's an unperson. He died fairly recently, and I think he deserves a lot more credit than that. So this is my talk. I uh, hope it's uh, illuminating to you. I have given you some reasons to believe otherwise than what you've been told about the Taj. What it really needs is a investigation of a more thorough nature especially of scientific dating, and uh, for scholars to take seriously the possibility that what they have been seeing is not part of the uh, history of Indian architecture. If the Taj is indeed not originally Muslim, then there are many other buildings in India and perhaps around the world that have to be called into question. And one does have to look at it. then into the Red Fort in Delhi, which was supposed to be uh, Shah Jahan's building. And <clears throat> there are other buildings that are, that are important in India that, that are said to be Muslim, the Humayun's tomb, the Kut Minar, and very important, Hatipur Sikri. Beyond India, the question of the origin of Muslim buildings has to be explored uh, anew, and one has to look at with a fresh eye um, along these lines that I've been discussing. So I want to thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope to get your comments when this appears on my website in the future.